Welcome. Thanks for coming to my talk. Hello, all from the code to the screen. I'm Jesus Espino. I work for Maramos. And well, I came from from Spain. I came by plane. For some people, can be can be a bit scary flying. It is not my case. I, with all that seats too close to each uh, each other. I most care about human interaction because I that kind of the guy that called support and say, oh thanks God, it's a machine. But well, back to the plane. There is a there's no reason for that thing to fly. Yes, we can talk about aerodynamics, suspension, high flow, all that stuff. But you know what? I don't buy it. It is magic. Right? And the reality is any advancement of technology is indistinguishable from magic. But here I am, the magic worked. And I'm going to talk to you about Hello World and the magic of the Go compiler. Well, first of all, I'm not a, a Go compiler programmer, so I don't uh, write the Go compiler code or something like that. All this talk is about my experience digging into the code and all that stuff. Uh, apart from that, my joke before uh, was a joke. I'm a very friendly person, so if you want to talk to me, feel free to reach me out in the Marmos booth later or through Twitter or whatever. So, well, let me introduce this nice guy here. Um, this is my Hello World program. He's going to be with us um, doing all the talk. And as you can see, it's a very simple Go program. We are going to talk about the Go compiler. More specifically, we are going to talk about the version 1.19. Everything in this talk is about that code base. That can change in the future, so just understand that. Well, but how the Go compiler works? Well, for most of the people, it is it is just magic, right? You get your Go code, you put that in the hat, there's some magician that is our Go compiler, and suddenly you have an executable binary. It's super fast, it's amazing. Uh, but what happened inside the hat? This is what we are going to see here. What happened, how that nice Hello World guy gets converted in that runnable uh, binary. Okay, these are the, fa the phases of the Go compiler. Don't pay too much attention to this talk. We are going to see this, this, sorry, this slide. We are going to see this slide over and over again during the, during the talk. It's just a, a map to show you where we are during the, during the talk. Let's start the scanner or the lecture. This is the first step of the Go compiler. It is going to convert our source code into tokens. The tokens are individual chunks that have meaning for Go. For example, um, an identifier is a token, a keyword is a token, an asterisk, a parenthesis, that kind of symbols are independent tokens. So that's the idea of a token. It's going to convert our code in this uh, meaningful token for the compiler. It's going to read one character at a time. Um, in reality, the lecture is a state machine that is reading characters and generating tokens. And it's going to generate the tokens on demand. It's going to, um, whenever you request a token, it's going to start reading characters, find, the to find a token, return the token, and wait until you request more. Who requests more? We are going to see it later. But this is a bit abstract. Let's see an example. This is uh, our Hello World. And the scanner or the lecture is going to start reading character by character. We are going to go with the scanner here and see what is going on. So it's going to read P A C K A G E. And then there is a space. So whenever it reads the space, it realizes that there is a token. But what kind of token? The first thing that the lecture is going to think, oh, this, this looks like an identifier, right? The thing is, uh, can be another thing, can be a keyword. So 
selector is going to check out the uh, the keywords table and it's going to realize that, oh yeah, it is a keyword, it's a package keyword. So I'm going to generate a package token. If I keep going, I'm going to see main. And it is again, something that looks like an identifier. Is main a keyword? No, it's not. So it is an identifier main. That's another token, an identifier token. Something that is funny is you see that semicolon there, that's automatically added by the lexer. We all know that uh, Go code doesn't have this need for adding the semicolon at the end. It's not because the language doesn't have it. It's because the lexer is adding automatically for us. So every time it finds a new line and the, the previous token is the right kind of token, it's going to introduce a semicolon automatically. So if we keep reading, I keep getting tokens, we can see that there's an import token, that's again, another keyword, a string token, FMT. We can keep going, func, another uh, keyword, ident, open parentheses, close parentheses, open braces, FMT, dot, println, you can see FMT and println are identifiers too. And again, on a string, close parentheses, close braces, and that's it. That's all our code in, in a different representation, but it's exactly the same code. So how the, um, the lecture work under the hood? We are going to see, this is the code, this is chunks of code of the lecture. So you can see it's very simple examples. For example, if the lecture find a semicolon character, that's a semicolon token that have a semicolon literal value. Yeah, easy PC. So if we go further, well, you can see that, okay, there is a dot um, character. That's a period token, right? That, that makes sense. But could it be something else? Yes. Um, if the character is, if the character that you're reading is a period token, but it's followed by another period token, and the character after that is again another period token, it's no longer a period, it's a ellipsis token. So it's going to consume some characters there with the S next, going to consume that characters because the state machine needs to know that you are consuming certain characters. And yeah, it is a Lipsis token there. Another interesting case, for example, is the asterisk. The asterisk can be a multiplication or a multiplication assignment. It depends on what follows the asterisk character. Um, for that is it's using this switch um, helper function. This switch helper function is going to check the next character and return the uh, return the token based on that. In this case, it's going to check if the second parameter is an equal and return a multiplication assignment in that case. And if not, it's going to return multiplication token. So that's the lexer. So once we have the lexer, we have all that tokens, we jump into the parser. Actually, that's not true because the parser is the one that is asking for tokens. The parser is going to keep asking for tokens to the lexer and the lexer is going to provide them on demand. Well, the, um, the parser is going to generate an abstract syntax tree. That is a tree structure that represents our code. It's a different representation of our code. It's more suitable for uh, the compiler to work with because it's just a tree structure and everything is, is more easy to, to understand. It's, um, and the AST of the parser is based on file. Every single Go file is going to have an AST representation inside the compiler. And it's interesting to see what can contain, um, what can contain a AST file. Well, AST. It can contain packages, it can contain imports, and it can contain declaration and nothing else. So you can't represent anything else in the in your file, in your Go file, because there's no representation in AST for that. The declarations can be declare a function, declare variables, declare constants, or declare types. That's it. There's nothing else that you can put in a Go file. And 
and it is it it uses some kind of relatively kind of recursive approach to build this tree. This AS tree is calling uh, delegating the build of sub trees to another functions. We are going to see that more in detail later. But what how it looks like if you the uh, AST in in Go, it, this is the how it looks like. This is the AST representation of our Hello World. Can be a bit um, strange for some people, but you can start seeing things that are have to be familiar to you. For example, here you have the package that is main. Okay, you have that information there. Also, you have the import there. It's kind of you can see that there. Also, you have the declaration of the function and the body of the function. Let's see more in detail how it, how it is built. The first thing is you start processing this AST and the AST is going to, it's going to start creating this AST file even before it start reading tokens because you know that you are processing a file already. Whenever you start reading the, the, the tokens, you read package, read the, the identifier main, and you already know that you have to put an identifier for the ASD file um, and the identifier is main. If you keep reading, you are going to see, oh, there is an import. So I'm going to create the structure, the node for the import, but I still don't know what you are importing. When I read FMT, I populate that and I keep going and get the function and get the body of the function and keep populating things in that way. But let's see the source code in the Go compiler for that. One interesting thing about the, the Go compiler is very well documented and have certain comments that are super useful. In this case, you can see there that um, there's the, the language definition of the, of the, the grammar of the import function. It's saying that any import is going to have a, well, it's going to come from the import keyword already, but it's going to have a dot or a package name and then the import path. And the import path is just a string literal. So these kind of comments are really useful. And the first thing when we find this import um, keyword is creating the import node, the import declaration node. Then I'm going to check if there's a name or a dot and do whatever is needed. And then I'm going to get the path literal and check if everything is okay. And then I'm going to return this new declaration node. After that, I can take a look to the function declaration. It is interesting, again, the, the comment here, because it's saying that the function declaration is function plus function, the function name, the type parameters, all that stuff. But also you can see that there's a method declaration that is pretty similar to the function declaration, but with the receiver there. So this function is taking care of the methods and the, and the function itself. And you can see here that every time you see a function, you create a function node, function declaration node. You can check if the receiver is there. If, has, if there is a left parenthesis, if there's a left parenthesis is the receiver, you are going to parse the parameters for the receiver. If there's uh, zero parameters is something is wrong, so I'm going to emit an error. If you have more than one parameter, is something is wrong, so I'm going to emit an error. And in any case, if there's one parameter, at least one parameter, I'm going to set the receiver of this function. Also, um, I'm going to check the name and store that name in the node. I'm going to check the function type and I'm going to delegate the body to another function, but it's going to be a, a complex function to parse the body of a function. And that's about the, about the, well, and I, I return the function declaration, of course, and that's about the parser. Once you have this AST representation, you can do type checking. And the type checker is going to collect all the package objects, and it's going to ch check the types for the, for the objects that are at package level, everything that is not function body, and then in a second pass, it's going to check all the function bodies because you need to have the context of the whole package uh, objects to be able to check properly the types of the function bodies. 
I'm not going to enter too much into details here because we have 13 time constraints. So um, I'm going to go directly to the intermediate representation. The intermediate representation is another, a different, well, it's here and it's different ASD representation. It's still a abstract syntax tree, but it's just slightly different. It's based on package, no longer on files. So each package has one intermediate representation. It's generated from the AST, uh, the previous AST that we have seen. It basically loops over all the files, ASTs, and generate this uh, intermediate representation. This is how uh, the intermediate representation looks like. You can see, again, the import of FMT is here. The main function is, is here. The body of the main function is here. But how is this generated? You have the, um, uh, for example, a constant declaration. A constant declaration is going to check the constant declaration node from the AST and check all the name list and check the types, the values, and all that stuff, store that information, and create a different kind of node, an intermediate representation node with information that comes from the AST. Another interesting example is the function definition. Again, uh, I, whenever I see a function declaration node in the AST, I'm going to create an intermediate representation node, a function node, and I'm going to check if it's an int function to do certain stuff and, and, and storing certain metadata in the intermediate representation. Another interesting thing is the go later, sorry, the G later. The G later is going to delegate that function to be executed in, a, uh, in another pass. And that is mainly for the function bodies. Every time I take a, every time I have to process a function, I'm going to process all the, all the other information and the, the body is going to be processed later. And finally, I'm going to store that in my, in my tree, in my intermediate representation tree. Okay, once we have the intermediate representation, we have the intermediate representation passes that are certain things that we are going, certain transformation that we are going to do with our intermediate representation. Well, one of them is dead code elimination. Everybody knows what it is. It's just code that is no longer um, accessible is going to be removed from here. Another interesting one is function call inlining. That is just searching what can be in line and what makes sense to inline and is going to try to inline directly here. The virtualized functions is another interesting one. When you have uh, an implementation, you have an interface and only have an implementation of that interface, it's going to devirtualize that. It's going to use at compile time, it's going to resolve that. That's the only struct that implements that interface that is going to be used in this function. So I'm going to use the, the implementation of that struct directly instead of using, instead of doing that dynamically during runtime. And the another interesting one is escape analysis. The escape analysis is going to analyze our variables to decide if they goes into the heap or into the stack. Well, this is a lot of info. Yeah, I know. So let's take a break. Look at the kitten if you want. <sighs> we have still a, lot, a long road ahead. So let's breathe and, and let's keep going. Well, static single assignment. The next step in the process is a static single assignment. Static single assignment is going to get me my intermediate representation and transform that, transform that, oh, sorry, transform that in the static single assignment. Static single assignment is a representation where you have basically variables that are only assigned once and they are not accessible before they are defined. That's the main two rules for SSA. And that representation is very useful, especially for optimizations, because with that, that representation, you can apply certain predefined, well-known uh, optimizations. Well, one, we have, uh, it's interesting that SSA is per function. You have one SSA per function in, in the Go code. 
the um, it's based it's it's based on blocks and values. We are going to see more better in a moment. This is the the idea. You have blocks. These blocks can be a uh, it block, can be an exit block, can be a return block. There's multiple type of blocks, and basically they differ from from each other in what is the the next block that they are going to execute. For example, um, a if block is going to have a a check at the end and it's going to decide if it goes to block one block or another. This kind of thing. Then you have inside each block that is going to be executed in sequence, you are going to see values. That values is going to be a value, an operation, a type, and a set of parameters. So that's how it's going to be represented, the values. The values are relatively similar to pseudo assembly. So you have to understand that for some things that we are going to explain later. So it's kind of pseudo assembly is, is already relatively near to, to assembly. And you can understand SSA a representation that is less based on the structure of the code and more based on the data flow. So you can you can see that that as these variables, this data is getting transformed in this way. And whenever this data have this value, we are going to go in this direction or in this other direction. There's a library that allows you to access the SSA information. It's very interesting and actually it's going to print kind of better representation or a nicer representation of the SSA. This is the SSA library representation of my code. Okay, how the SSA is generated? Well, you can you normally have a body of a function that have a list of statements and that list of statements, you load over that and process a statement by a statement and each statement is going to check the operation that is doing and that operation that is doing is going to have a case in a big switch case uh, with big switch case blocks that you can find in the code. For example, one of these is the old declaration, the operation for declaration. That is interesting because it's using the escape analysis information that we get before to decide if that goes to the heap or the stack. Also, you can see there the bar definition that is going to generate a value for that. Also, it's interesting the if declaration, the, the if operation, because you are going to see here that if there's a constant condition, I'm not going to even create the block itself. I'm just going to go directly to the to the definitions there. If there's um if not. If there's not a constant, is is something that can be if or else or or can be if or not if. It's going to create a new block. Then it's going to check if there's a body or if there's an else, and it's going to populate everything, and it's going to check if the length of the body is there is there, and if going to add different edges to this block, add different pointers to the next block. And finally, it's going to add the, the end of the block there. Okay. But what more interesting than how the SSA is generated is what the SSA is for. And the SSA is for optimizations. There's some SSA passes that are to optimize our code. And one of them is dead code elimination again, but this time is based on these operations, this data that we, these values that we are generating. Then, for example, you have source circuit also, source circuit optimization that is going to check Boolean, um, Boolean expressions in conditions and reorder them to try to source circuit and avoid doing certain calculations. Common sub expression is another well-known optimization that basically says that you have one plus A plus B and five plus A plus B, A plus B is a common sub-expression. So you can extract that, recalculate that, and reuse the result instead of calculating every single time. The most interesting one for me is lower. Lower is going to take all this SSA that is pseudo-assembly, generic pseudo-assembly, and it's going to transform that generic set of operations independent from your CPU into something that is CPU dependent. 
And the reason for that is sometimes, depending on your architecture, your CPU architecture, you are going to need one extraction or you are going to need three instructions or you are going to need a different way of doing things. So whenever you do the lowering, after the lowering, you are going to execute another set of optimization in the new, in the new, in the new SSA. So that's the reason for the lowering. And actually some of that optimizations are repeated from the previous phases. Okay, this is an example of our SSA, that our SSA in before the passes of our hello world. And this is the SSA after the passes. So pretty good reduction, reduction of code. Okay, machine code generation. Once we have the SSA, we have the machine code generation. This is going to use the lower machine dependent optimized SSA representation to generate an architecture specific um, assembly. It's going to, if you, if you store that in a file, it's going to be stored in a dot off file that is specific for, for Go. This is how it looks like. You can see certain similarities between uh, both codes uh, because this uh, is just derived from, from the previous ones. You can see these some functions about how the machine code generation is, is done. For example, it's going to check the operation, the, well, the SSA operations. And if, if certain type of operation is going to create a prog, a prog is, is a pseudo assembly. Again, it's kind of the assembly representation of a, of a it's assembly instruction. Again, another instruction here related to call is if that call is a, it's going to be a tail call, it's going to use another function. But it's if that normal call is going to delegate that in the call function, that I'm going to show it here. Again, the call function is generating a prog that is going to be a fraction for the assembly. And also you can see here that depending on the architecture is going to do certain things or on others, for example, using register or using memory. Well, now we have our machine code, but it's not, we are not there yet. We need to take our machine code and link everything together. We are going to take our already um, compiled code or already machine code uh, with all the libraries, all that stuff, all the packages. And we are going to put everything together and we are going to add the runtime on top of that. And that is what, what is going to generate our executable. We are here. But what is the runtime? The runtime is an essential part of the Go compiler, well, the, the Go ecosystem. It is going to have the implementations for the maps, slices, channels, Go routine, and a lot of other things. Also, it's going to take care of the memory management. It's going to have the garbage collector, the code for the garbage collector. It's going to have the code for the scheduler for schedule our Go routines. And it's going to have the start that uh, process. Whenever you run a Go binary, the main function is not the first thing that gets executed. It's the runtime startup process. The runtime startup process is going to start our garbage collector, start our Go routine, go, sorry, our scheduler, and run our main function in a Go routine. That's the idea of the runtime. And well, um, if you were here during the tiny Go talk, um, you see that the binary size is 1.8 megabyte for a hello world. This is the reason we need all this stuff for uh, have all that amazing features about concurrency and things like that that you have in Go. So, yeah. And to the screen. Well, at this point, I expect that you perceive uh, the Go compiler less as magic and more as data transformation. So let's see how we, we use our binary to print something to the screen. The reality is for doing that, we need a bit of magic. Again, our, 
our Go binary is going to write a, uh, write to a file descriptor, can uh, call the standard out, and and that's it. Our binary doesn't know anything else. It's the operating system, the one that is going to do the trick this time and print to the screen. Basically, if it's using something that is called syscalls, or we are here, it's using something that is called syscalls, that is how you communicate with your operating system. In this case, it's using the right syscall to the standard out file descriptor to say to the operating system, I need to print this to the screen. And how we can see that? Well, we can use the S-Trace tool. The S-Trace is going to give us the syscall, tra syscall trace of our binary. And we can see here that you have a write syscall to the file descriptor one, that is the standard out, the, with the hello world string. And that's going to tell our operating system that print something to the screen. OK, let's summarize a bit some things here. You can see here that we have a file with a source code that is going to go through the lecture. We are going to have a lot of tokens. You then go, then you go through a parser, you have this abstract syntax tree. Then you take the, check the types, transform that abstract syntax tree into a intermediate representation that in reality is another abstract syntax tree. Then you are going to do that process for dead code elimination, inlining, the virtualizing, escape analysis. Then when you have all that transformations done, you are going to convert your intermediate representation in a SSA representation. You are going to optimize that. You are going to generate the machine code. And finally, you are going to link everything together with the runtime, execute your binary. Your binary is going to send its calls and boom, you are already in the screen. So, well, one detail is all the illustrations of this talk are um, made by Juan de la Cruz from the Pempo team, an open source project. The, the, um, the graphics are completely Creative Commons here, so public domain. If you want to download them, there's the URL. And yeah, some references here. The documentation of the Go compiler is amazing especially in the source code. If you go to the source code, there's a lot of comments, a lot of very well structured comments uh, with a lot of information, with a lot of detail. Also that you can see some readme files that is going to give you a uh, overview, a very interesting overview about the compiler. For example, the, well, the compile readme is an overview. If you want to see more detail on SSA specifically, the readme for the SSA is, is amazing. Well, there's a documentation about how the assembly uh, is defined that this kind of pseudo assembly that is generic for all all the all the architectures. Uh, there's a very good document uh, there. And some SSA talks really recommend to see them and the and a, and a talk about the Go assembler. Well, has been a long talk. Um, and a bit dense, to be honest. But I hope now you have a better understanding about the Go compiler, the runtime, and the language itself. Well, I expect that all of you see now the, the Go compiler less as magic and more just, just data transformation. But for me, the most important thing is I hope now the compiler feels a bit less intimidating. Because I want to encourage you to go to there, read, learn from it, or even modify it. Because it, it is going to be hard and it's going to be exhausting sometimes. But all that clicks in your mind, all that aha moments, that's my go first friends. That's magic. Thank you. <laughs>